Welcome back everyone to the 2023 Global Animal Disaster Management Conference. I'm gonna ask you to raise your hands if this is the first time you join us because there are a few housekeeping issues um, that I'd like to uh, forego if you've heard them already. Otherwise, you, it's important um, that I let you know. First of, first of, uh, first of all, there is an email for those, uh, especially for those living in Australia and Sydney, Sydney zone uh, time zone, uh, entitled "Important Update for JADMC Delegates," and this email explains a glitch in the <clears throat> in the Sydney time zone. Uh, a glitch of, five, of four hours. So it's important that you check it out uh, in case you want to listen to your colleagues in New York or so on. So again, the title of the email is important update for JADMC delegates, okay? Um, as I said uh, before, this uh, Zoom chat, uh, the chat feature is disabled, but please make your questions and answers uh, with plenty of time so we can try to answer them, especially the presenter. Uh, and you also have the possibility of multilingual closed captions. Just look for the uh, icon at the bottom of your Zoom screen. And as a reminder, this video recording will not be available until it's been edited and released later, um, later this year, yeah. So it's my pleasure to um, present to you, introduce you to Dr. Lawrence Garcia, Medical Director for the Veterinary Emergency Treatment Service at the University of Florida College of Veterinary Medicine in the US. And the title of his presentation, as you can read it, is Hurricane Ian Animal Medical Response, Lessons Learned and Future Opportunities. <clears throat> the floor is yours, Mr. Garcia. Thank you very much. So yes, today I'm gonna to talk to you a little bit about our team and uh, a lot about what we did down in Fort Myers, Florida following Hurricane Ian. And so we'll talk a little bit about of our, our unique cache of equipment and supplies, uh, some of the field medical triage we do, um, case presentations and things along those lines. So to give you a little bit of background, our team was born in 2004 where the state of Florida was hit by several hurricanes uh, through the season, so much so that the governor decided it was important to have uh, the veterinary school help participate in the animal response needs. And so we began getting some equipment and some items through grants and through support from the state and federal funding and developed this team to you know, respond to hurricanes, hoarding cases, disease outbreaks, oil spills. And then also our team does some technical rescue training and response as well. And so because there has been so much need, we've been able to uh, build our team and, and still going strong. And we are, we function as a part of the state through the state agricultural response team. And that's with the Florida Department of Agriculture. So, you know, all the common natural man-made disasters, um, our team is equipped to respond. The pictures there actually show our team that went down to Key West following Hurricane Irma and all the impacts down there. And so we're pretty well equipped to handle most situations. And thankfully through the state and through all the funding that started our team, we have trucks and trailers and equipment and air conditioned tents and things like that so that we can function out in the field and be completely uh, self-sustaining. That's the biggest thing. So we bring our own fuel, we bring our own water, we bring our own bedding and food and everything to kind of support our team when we're out in the field. So uh, some of the things that we have, we use the four drawer tool carts that are fairly commonly used for all different kinds of tools and they're on, on wheels. And so we fill them up and set them up as an examination room. So syringes, needles, um, you know, stethoscopes, thermometers, microchip scanners, gloves, and each cart is set to serve uh, 70 to 100 animals. And, and they're built in such a way that we can just roll it out of uh, the area and bring in a fresh new one and kind of restock that one in the meantime. So we're set up to expand and contract as we need to and it serves us really well because we can use a tent or even an air-conditioned trailer as an examination space. Um, 
in these two lower pictures, we're actually in a surgical unit that I'll show you some pictures of in a minute here. But uh, we are pretty much equipped to handle whatever is needed. Generally, we do uh, organize our supplies based on what our mission is. And we do not leave without a mission from the state or a state partner. And so uh, generally, we tailor our equipment to what kind of cases and what kind of situations we'll encounter. So these are some of our trucks and trailers. The large orange trailer is actually a bunk trailer that sleeps 12. And it has a fully functioning bathroom with shower and sink and toilet. And so that's one of the newest additions to our team equipment. And um, it, it serves us very well and it's air conditioned and you know has generator powered. And so we can take that in the field with us. The trailer kind of right behind it, the horse trailer is actually our team's uh, animal technical rescue response trailer, but we also use that for training first responders throughout the state of Florida in animal technical rescue response. And more recently, we've had uh, responders come from other states as well to take our training. So the upper pictures are from the inside of our medical surgical unit that has two wet tables as well as two surgical tables. And this generally serves as our hospital area. It also has some cage space. And so we can function pretty well out in the field. It is fully operational by generator and it uh, is built into the front part of the trailer unit. And um, so we can pretty much function out in the field uh, and use this as our hospital space. And then down below, you can see pictures of the bunk trailer up close, as well as the interior spaces within that bunk trailer. The nice thing about our bunk trailer is the bunks do fold up flush to the wall so that we can actually use that to haul equipment and materials and potentially turn that trailer into a command center. So it's pretty multifunctional. Here, because we're in the veterinary teaching hospital, we have our pharmacy cache. And so what we do is this pharmacy cabinet stays in the hospital pharmacy and the medications that we take with us are generally monitored on a regular basis to make sure that everything stays in date and is rotated through the pharmacy stock so that you know for us our biggest season is between June and November but of course more concentrated September October are usually the most common times that we are deployed and so because those medications sit for you know extended periods of time this way we can actually rotate it through pharmacy stock to cut down on our losses as well as costs but it's a uh, probably about a six or seven foot tall cabinet and as you can see it's on wheels and so we access it uh, when needed from the pharmacy but it stays there permanently because in a, when we're out in the field there's generally no infrastructure oftentimes we have to rely on uh, paper records and in the state of Florida, you have to have approval to take pictures of people. We have uh, a release for treatment, a release for anesthesia in the event that we need to sedate or anesthetize an animal. And so these are all in triplicate. So we keep copies for ourselves and then we give the client two copies so that that way they have one for their regular veterinarian and one for themselves. And it just sort of depends on the type of cases we're seeing. If we're seeing shelter animals, then of course our client is the shelter. If we're seeing uh, privately owned animals, then of course that would go to the client themselves and their regular veterinarian. But they're pretty basic forms, pretty easy to fill out. And, and we do it in such a way that it, it makes it such that we keep a copy for ourselves. So whenever there's questions, which we did have some questions that came up after Hurricane Ian or people needing medical records, we were able to share those with them. So the only way that we function effectively is through partnerships. And so we work with the state emergency support function or ESF 17 and the county ESF 17. Uh, Florida is unique in that we are one of the states, one of a few states that have an ESF 17 that's very specific towards animal issues. Um, and of course, you know, we take UF, University of Florida faculty, staff, and students. This way it gives veterinary students some training in disaster response and some opportunities to experience it so that they can actually work for their community when they graduate. 
Uh, we work very closely with the Florida Veterinary Medical Association and the Florida Technician Association. And on this particular deployment, uh, the partnership really was extremely fruitful and such that we had 60 plus volunteers over the period of 10 days, which allowed us to see 422 animals. And we couldn't have done it without all the local resources and veterinarians and veterinary technicians who came and veterinary practitioners who uh, shared some of their equipment from their practices that were, you know, outside the major area of impact to help us out. And then there were some of the veterinarians in the area of impact that were able to help as well. Uh, University of Florida Institute of Food and Agricultural Sciences, the UF IFAS, they are, you know, a very strong partner as well. And of course, we work with pharmaceutical distributors to get medications and things like that. And then, of course, local pharmacies, uh, regional emergency facilities, and pretty much we try to make connections with as many as we can when we get in the area. We like to make sure the local veterinarians know that we're there as an option, as well as know that we're there to help and make sure there's no competition. Um, and the reason restaurant, wholesaler, or warehouse supply is important is because at any given time, our logistics team might have to feed 30 plus people. And so we do try to, we bring food with us, but we do try to source more food while we're there to make sure that we can keep everybody fed. These are some pictures of some of the initial um, uh, responders from the Florida Veterinary Medical Association. And they were able to get on the scene a little earlier than we were within a couple of days of the storm. Of course, it's very hard to get into areas like this, especially with such widespread damage and such widespread impacts. And search and rescue definitely dominates the initial portion of the response. And so once they know they've found all those they can find and have, have you know, taken care of people and animals, uh, then they start bringing in these other resources. But it's so important for the other resources not to be in the way as they're trying to provide help. Some of the things that you'll notice, uh, because the Barrier Island, Sanibel, Pine Island, and Captiva were so heavily impacted, they had to actually take helicopters to get out to those islands to check on the people and their animals. Uh, what you'll notice in some of these other pictures, these are pictures from the inside of uh, Fort Myers Coliseum, and that's where there was a pet-friendly shelter. And pet friendly sheltering has come a long way. We used to have the co-located shelters where the animals were in a separate space from the people. But we have found over time, you know, these pet friendly shelters that allow you to be cohabitated works the best because owners and pets can stay together. And uh, this way it cuts down on the manpower needed to take care of all the animals and uh, keep everybody healthy and safe. And throughout the state of Florida, thanks to the Pets Act, which uh, was is a law that was started kind of right after Hurricane Katrina, because so many people and their animals were separated because of widespread impacts there, uh, it, the Pets Act has paved the way to have counties actually make a plan for having pet-friendly sheltering. And so that's what happened in Lee County there in Fort Myers, where they did a really good job of setting up. They had three or four pet-friendly shelters in the beginning of things. So how this all worked for us is we the Lee County ESF-17 requested veterinary support in the form of a field hospital. And so they put in their request to the state and then the state deployed us. And so we worked in conjunction with the, AF the FEMA and uh, brought us in. And basically, we, of course, once we knew the mission was a field hospital, which is pretty much our strong suit, uh, we went ahead and loaded accordingly and set everything up so that we could get on our way. So where we were located is where that red dot is there in the middle. So the county put us in this location here because we were very central to the whole area that was most heavily impacted. Those lighter grade areas around that uh, red pointer there pretty much is the area of the deepest and most heavily uh, impacted areas. And so they put us there so that we could be centrally located and accessible. And we found that we were fairly accessible. 
for the most part, the strays were going to the shelters and they were able to manage that, but we did work closely with the shelter to provide care to the animals that were coming to us and resources to the people, such as food and things like that. So we were actually in the Terry Sports Park complex, which you can illustrate it here in the green box. And we were located kind of in that middle circle where the, the, the red circle is. And why I point this out is because we're when we're on deployment, we have a lot of equipment and a lot of individuals and a lot of things. And it's really important to keep everybody safe. And, and you know, we, we need, you know, if we can have resources, we do like to have those. And so because we were in this park, we actually, they already had power and running water when we arrived. And so we actually had extra housing, which worked out perfectly beyond the bunk trailer because we had many more at, at times we were housing 30 and 40 people at night. Um, so the bunk trailer wasn't, you know, big enough to house all of those people. So we were able to house people in bunk beds in these air conditioned clubhouses around the baseball diamonds. And then, of course, we had, uh, you know, electric and water so that we could actually, you know, run, do the cooking and things like that uh, and run generators less. There are certain generators that run all the time, but um, we were well located and very secure in this area. So it's always really important because part of my mission is when they're sending us some places to make sure we have the resources we need and to make sure that, you know, we can have as many resources as possible to support the team and our efforts. Um, so here, what you're going to see is kind of our layout for how we set everything up. And so the orange box in the middle is kind of our, you know, you can see our intake area. And we had waiting area tents with water and Gatorade. And then we had an air conditioned exam tent. We have our hospital medical surgical unit, but we actually had to use, uh, we also needed to use another, a trailer, which was air conditioned as another exam space so we could get through and process those animals. And then we always kind of have our living space tucked away from the main area so that we can uh, get our, uh, keep our team in a place where they can have some quiet time. So here are some pictures from the camp and we had some, uh, we were lent some lab equipment. We actually did a blood transfusion on a goat. We had to deal with some diabetic cats having some issues. We had a potential parvo. Um, the bulldog over here to the right with the umbrella over it, uh, got into some toxins that were pretty bad. And so uh, we did some supportive care for him. And over five days, we brought him back around. And so he did really well. We had a couple lacerations and some other things that had to be tended to with uh, minor surgical procedures. And so we're equipped to do it all as, as we need to. And you can see this picture with these sort of blue backgrounds and the white is actually our air conditioned tent. And that's our main exam space. So the common things, especially what we see with hurricanes, is uh, vomiting, diarrhea, stomach upset, skin and ear issues, the allergies tend to flare up, um, injuries of all different kinds for various reasons, um, upper respiratory type issues. We have this little kitten here who became the uh, deployment kitten. Uh, one of our team members uh, adopted her during the deployment because she was found stray. And actually, she served as a uh, emotional support animal for the team. And so this kitty is pretty much used to just about anything and, and likes to be held and supported as we had her. Um, you, you know, urinary issues, ophthalmic things. Uh, we do occasionally encounter the need for euthanasia. And we are prepared for that. Um, dehydration, saltwater intoxication, things like that. So we can definitely encounter quite a few things on these. And so basically what I do with my medical inventory and, uh, you know, medications and, and equipment is, is kind of being prepared for all the possibilities and we do the best we can with what we have. I generally stock the team such that we can go seven days without any kind of supply replacement. Um, but generally by five or six days, we can usually get some supplies. Uh, we did have some other, you know, more odd things like anal gland abscesses, um, you know, neoplasias that kind of went awry, um, you know, definitely endocrine problems that are ongoing, but the stress of the whole experience um, can create some issues there. And then, of course, anxiety, 
you know, things related to the flooding and all that that occurred. Uh, we had to do an enucleation, a couple of nucleations. We had a couple laceration repairs, one of which was a dog that encountered uh, an alligator. And then, of course, the blood transfusion on the goat. We saw quite a few rabbits, some reptiles. Um, so just kind of the whole mix of things. You just never know what you're going to see. So, two minutes you know, left. what's that? Two, two minutes left. Okay. And so, um, you know, with deployments, you run into space limitations, financial constraints, you know, lack of infrastructure, you know, the various things that you run into that can be a problem. And so, you know, you are serving the local community. So you want to kind of, you know, get out there and make sure you're helping where you can and helping where it's needed. And, um, but it does give you a chance to try new things, to try the procedures and protocols and update those as we go. Um, so basically, you know, communication is everything, like with every issue and, you know, partnerships and collaboration is, you know, the three together are the perfect uh, method to keep everything going and be successful. Uh, volunteer coordination was so important. I was managing 60 volunteers, a mix of veterinarians and, and technicians, and it was amazing how well everybody did. And, you know, everybody was there for the same reason. And we worked hard and we got so much done and did so much good. Um, sometimes, you know, as far as lessons learned, we needed a team that could go out on scouting missions to address some of the issues that were coming through in requests, but we were mostly concentrated on our camp. And then we talk about incident command system training is really important, but really and truly, as long as the leadership has had that training, that's the biggest thing. Opportunities for the future, get cities and counties on board with trying to get their resources before the storm, before the disaster, so that they know who to call, when to call, how to get them there. Um, better communication, once again, at the local level. And then, you know, finding more funding mechanisms. It's very difficult to fund these deployments and they can be quite costly. And then, of course, you know, having some mixed animal technicians and veterinarians that can do some large animal calls when those come through. And then if there's some way to do some kind of volunteer management software. So we try to teach as many people around the state that we are a resource and all around the Southeast, really. And then, um, you know, try to be adaptable. That's the biggest thing that we've learned along the way. And then making sure we have a mission to deploy and then looking at deployment locations and things like that for safety and support and tailoring our needs for, you know, the situation calls for. And then, you know, being prepared for the common things. Any questions? Thank you very much, Doctor. That was a really interesting conversation. It reminded me of uh, the World Kitchen helping the teams uh, help the Ukrainian Ukrainian refugees come through the borders, and the World Kitchen was the one that fed those teams. Uh, do you have one question about uh, whether or not you have uh, you have uh, you you treat uh, large animals? We do when it's requested. The state is very particular about what the requests are, so we try to stay within those parameters, but we do have the ability to deploy even like a, a field team with like a, a truck that's, you know, an ambulatory truck. Excellent. Um, we have about one minute before we need to log out for uh, for the reasons of the uh, the capturing of the video. <clears throat> I think I think the planning, the amount of planning and logistics behind uh, your work it's huge you just make it sound like it's very easy but uh, <laughs> there is a lot of work we used to do a uh, fraction of of your uh, of your uh, capacity uh, in the third world countries and it's um it's it's a struggle thank you again very much for your thank contribution you. and uh, we hope you can we can see you again at the uh, round table thank you